just first of all, I just want to touch on the initiative you're doing out here with these kids. It's, uh, it's not very often, as you were talking about earlier, that kids from the local area get an opportunity to play on their local team's sort of professional ground. You know what I mean? And their PE lesson, which is fantastic. So what kind of made you want to be a part of something like this and the impact you're kind of having on the community? So we set up the GFC school about three or four years ago. And uh, last April, we had an Ofsted inspection and uh, we got two outstandings and three goods. So overall good, or four goods, I think it was. Um, and, and these are children between 11 and 16. Um, we're, in effect, we're an alternative provision. So children who aren't comfortable in education, in mainstream education, uh, they come here. Um, they come here with um, lots of different challenges of, often. Um, but we provide a safe learning environment for them. Our safeguarding is very high. They feel very secure here. Uh, they feel loved. They, their self-esteem starts to rise. They feel that they're part of society. You know, we teach them about... We teach a proper curriculum, but we also teach them about uh, social issues, you know, knife crime, drugs, getting into trouble, gangs, etc. Uh, all the kind of things these kids have got to face growing up now, really. We have uh, guest speakers come in and speak at their assembly from different parts of life. Uh, local MPs have been in a number of times, uh, local dignitaries. Uh, fortunately, in my role, obviously, I get to meet a lot of VIP football stars. So people like Michael Owen have been in, uh, Dennis Wise has been in, um, Actually, the kids talk Dennis quite a lot, to be fair. Um, so, so it's good for them. They get certain privileges that perhaps other kids in mainstream education won't give. I mean, their games lesson today is here out on the pitch. Well, I don't suppose there are many school PE lessons out on a professional football pitch, but um, given our pitch isn't going to get used for the, the foreseeable future, and given the groundsman's not here, he's been isolated, so he can't stop them. Um, I just thought, well, why not let them play their games lesson on the pitch today? I mean, and they're absolutely loving it. So, um, so, so that's why we set the school up, and um, it's grown in numbers now to 41 children. I think we're probably the only professional football club in the country to have a, 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 a proper school from 11 to 16 year olds within the school, uh, within the stadium. Um, and right now, they're the only thing that are functioning within the stadium because everyone else is off, uh, apart from my financial team who are here trying to uh, find how to make a pound go a long way. Um, everyone else is off, so so that's where we are. So how are we sort of coping now and in, in realism because it is still a business it's still a, still a functioning business and as we were talking about before there are the other aspects of the businesses not being able to, to flourish at this moment in time so how are we coping? Well part of our income or a big part of our income stream come from non-football activities like we have a conference and banqueting centre here uh, we have a factory theme bar uh, we have obviously the school we have other initiatives that are bringing in income but every other initiative everything else is stopped our conference and banqueting Obviously, we can't have mass gatherings. Uh, events have been cancelled. Weddings are getting cancelled. Uh, income stopped. Um, so we very much have almost no income now. Um, we have some savings. Obviously, we have some money in the bank. Uh, and my role, my role is, you know, become very responsible insofar as uh, I have to try and see how far that money can go, how many months we can get by, by paying people not necessarily their full salaries or, or salary at all but paying them enough money that I believe they can survive on, given they may have to make other arrangements within their own personal lives, like they might need to talk to their mortgage companies, their banks, car loans, uh, liabilities, school fees, uh, and maybe just request a, a, a sort of a holiday, a three-month or two-month or month-to-month -month holiday. So I think we're in this together. I think it's not a solution I can cure on my own. I can prolong the income and pr prolong giving people money for as long as the money lasts. Um, so we're looking for help from within football with the Premier League. We're looking for help externally from the government. Um, maybe we can have a relief from HMRC. So money we would normally pay to HMRC, we use that to pay staff and keep them going longer. Because this is now not an issue about just football. This is a national issue. It's a world issue. And, um, you know, if I were... If I've got one loaf of bread, I have to try and make that one loaf of bread feed as many people for as long as possible before it runs out. And then when it runs out, I'm not sure where we go. I mean, there's so many different issues I want to touch on there, but when you speak about the help that you want from the Premier League, obviously it's such a lucrative business. It's worldwide. It's, it's well documented how much money the English Premier League does make. How much help can they actually provide to some of the lower leagues? Well, I think, I think the, the, each division has its own issues, but predominantly leagues one and two uh, don't have wealthy benefactors who can incur losses every year of 10, 15, 20, 30 million pounds, which is what's happening in the championship. 
the Premier League is, is as we know, flush with money. I mean, it's and you know, I'm not against that. I think that's what it is. I don't have any jealousy towards that. I'm slightly envious, but um, every day I try and help the manager to build a better team to get us to the Premiership one day. So that's our dream, really. Uh, whether that will ever happen or not, time will determine. But it, as long as it's our dream, we keep going because as long as it becomes impossible, then what's the point? You know, why, why are we doing what we do? But but I, you know, the Premier League are not. Uh, they, you know, I know most of the chairmen in the Premier League. They're not. They're good people. The Premier League are a good organisation, and they will be realising that they, you know, that they can give assistance to the football league and particularly leagues one and two. Uh, my view is that probably two and a half million pound, three million pound per Premier club uh, would give enough money to the leagues one and two to perhaps keep them going for another three or four months. Um, so I would hope that they're looking at that. I would hope they're going to be coming forward to the Football League and saying, look, this is the assistance we think we can give. Um, but, but equally, I, I believe that the League One and Two are a very different challenge to the Championship. And the Championship have been incurring significant losses for the last four or five years that, that are unhealthy, in my view. Um, but they've clearly got benefactors that are happy to write out big checks every year. So this, this next three or four months, maybe six months, isn't going to make a huge difference. You know, it just means they'll make a bit more loss. Um, and the Premier League quite clearly don't rely on, on gate money for their income. So they could play behind closed doors. Um, so I hope that the, the football world unites and realises it can help its own. I don't think we're expecting big handouts from government because why would, why, you know, we're, we're no different to any other business that's suffering at the moment. Um, but I just think that there are certain ways that, that businesses can be helped just to get through this next few months without laying all their staff off. You being a respected chairman and, and one of the leaders of course in the Football League, have you spoken to other sort of people in your same position and, and how are they coping with this sort of situation? Well they're all in the same boat, I mean they're all scratching around trying to find ways, you know in some ways we're slightly better off than some because we have got some income in the bank uh, that we can get through the next month or two. Um, some haven't got, you know some live in, are living literally hand to mouth, they, their gate money comes in on a match day and it goes out the day after. Um, and of course, every game that they're losing, and we're all going to lose five or six home games for sure this season, uh, with crowds, um, that's going to have a, an impact, negative impact on all their finances, of course. Um, so I think I think we're all in the same boat, trying to float ideas off each other. You know, I spoke to the chairman of Barnet this morning, um, Tony Cleanthus, who's a friend of mine from many years. You know, he explained why he's done what he did. I understand it fully. Um, and there'll be other clubs making similar or, 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 or you know, similar decisions, I guess, uh, over the coming days. I mean, the only reason I brought the financial staff in this week, um, and I explained to them, is I need to work with them to see exactly where we are, exactly what we can achieve, what happens if we don't pay creditors in full or at all for the next month, what happens if we don't pay the revenue, can we get a holiday, can we get a, a deferment, can we get it written off? You know, loan, loans are not necessarily the answer because... Um, if we don't have the income in a six months time, which we won't, if we lose the games, we lose the games, how do we pay back the loans? So, you know, whilst loans might help us in the short term, it moves the problem further down the road. So I think it's a mixture of all things. We've got to try and work, you know, what happens if the schools all get shut? Does Medway Council stop making us any payments? In which case we, have, we lose that income as well. So everyone's in the same boat, of course. You know, the man that supplies our pies... If we can't pay him, he can't pay the man who, who supplies him with the flour or whatever you make a pie with. Um, so it's a knock-on effect, really, and I think that's we have to be considerate to everyone uh, in society, not just ourselves at the moment. I think you're, from a footballing perspective, probably the most well-balanced person to sort of ask this question because there's different opinions as you would want within the football community. Some people are saying to avoid the season altogether and just restart again next year. But then, of course, we talk about the ramifications. Some are saying to end the season at this point and, and conclude it with those sort of positions as they are. And, of course, those have ramifications as well. You being a sort of a mid-table team as you are at this position right now, you would have your ambitions to maybe want to get into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But how do you kind of see it from your perspective as to how they should conduct the end of the season? Well, I think, I think to... Stop the season now and say that's it will be a disaster. I think that would be the worst possible outcome. And I can see massive ramifications for that for, for a variety of reasons, from, from a variety of sources. Broadcasting contracts, sponsorship contracts, um, people who felt they could have got in the Premier that don't, people who felt they could have got in the Championship that don't, people who managed to avoid relegation because of the situation. 
So I think I think there is a it, that is fraught with problems, and and that will be my least the worst possible scenario for football as a competition. Uh, my view, and I've expressed that view to the Football League board that are meeting today in London. Uh, my view is that we could play our games behind closed doors. Our players are in self-isolation, just looking after themselves. Um, we could have a situation where they come straight from their homes to the game. They don't necessarily have to segregate, uh, congregate together in the changing room. They could come ready for the game. They could go and play the games. They could leave straight after. The risks of them getting cross-contaminated would be minimal. Uh, and we, we get the competition finished. And that would be my, my hope that that can be achieved. If, if we delay it by about three or four weeks, maybe, and start that process then, if, if, if this virus somehow disappears as quickly as it came, which is highly unlikely in my view, uh, then we could get crowds in. So much the better. Um, but we must, in my view, finish the competition. And we must finish it so that we can be ready to start August, even if August is delayed to September, we can be ready to start the new season with everyone in the right divisions, in the right places, and all, you know, God willing, we'll, 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 we'll have conquered this, this war against this virus uh, by the summer, the end of the summer, and hopefully August, September could be the start of a fresh new season with crowds coming back and enjoying the, the, you know, the future, as we all hope we will be. It's so good to hear your insight, you basically sort of indicated you want maybe an extension of the season, so to go on throughout the summer and then maybe just knock on straight into the next season straight Well, I think, I think the players need a, probably a month break, so maybe the break is in August. You know, maybe we come back for pre-season in August, they have July off, you know, and therefore we could finish the season in June. You know, it doesn't matter about whether Wembley's available at this stage for playoffs or finals because we can play a playoff and a, and a final anywhere. Could be at any stadium, couldn't it? Could be a neutral stadium. So, so I don't think we should be too hung up by other obligations of Wembley. Uh, obviously, the Euro, Euros have now been cancelled, so that, that, that takes a little bit more pressure off everyone. So I don't see any reason why we couldn't maybe not play in March uh, and then play behind closed doors from April. Or indeed, we could start playing behind closed doors right away. I mean, might be a, you know, a few days on the pitch with the groundsman and we're ready to play. So, so if, if the feeling was that we need a bit more delay, then right off March, start playing behind closed doors in April. We've only got 10 games to play, most clubs, less than 10. Uh, we can play two games a week, five weeks, we're done. So we must be able to fit five weeks of games, you know, or six weeks as a max, uh, between now and, say, the end of July. Uh, or the beginning of July, end of June. In which case you have July off, you know, pre-season, come back in August, start the season in September. Easy. I think my final question to you would just be from a, from a football perspective, but also from a wider society perspective. A lot of Gillingham fans will watch this now, and a lot of other fans are in a similar sort of position to you around the League One, League Two, and want to know, how, how long does a club like yourself, can, how long can you survive in these sort of conditions is the most important question. Well, if we are able to get uh, relief from HMRC, then we can use that money towards you know, uh, staff salaries. And when I say staff, I mean everyone. I don't just mean players being different to everyone else because we're all the same. We're all on the same ship. You know, we all still need to fill our stomachs and get our cars with some fuel in. So everyone's got the same issue. Uh, liabilities and other problems, well, I'm sure we individuals can defer those liabilities. So it doesn't mean that if you've got a salary of £500 a week... Um, you need that money to survive. You know, this is about survival now. So providing that our, all our staff collectively buy into the concept that, you know, we're not talking about not getting their salaries, we're talking about deferring their salaries, what they would normally get for a later date, but giving everyone a sum of money that they can survive on. Now, if, that's, if that is what I put in place, which is what we're working on now, um, whether it's legal, illegal, it doesn't matter. It's about survival. You know, if I take the consequences later, I take the consequences later. But what's important is that people can feed their families, they can eat, they can put some fuel in their car so they can get out to the shops. Um, and that's pretty much it, really. Uh, and they've got a roof over their head. I think those are the three most important commodities right now. And we are in a war. You know, it's been said by many commentators and politicians, this is, um, this is like nothing we've ever experienced. So all I can do is say, well, we've got this amount of um, money, if we all agree to this principle of everyone taking less at the minute and making up their salaries later, um, we, can go left, we can go further. And how long of a time frame are you thinking? Three months, probably, before we run out of cash. Mm -hmm. And that's assuming we get a bit of assistance from HMRC yeah. and we can use that money for, for people's survival. After that, I have no answers. And I don't suppose anyone else has.